Well, hiya, gonna catch up with the next article in the series today um, on this quiet Sunday. No fishing reports tonight, so why not spend the next uh, 15 minutes with me listening to some past tales. This is from October 2008's issue of Match Fishing Magazine. But before we get into that, of course, got to go to your uh, reader submissions. Here we have a fantastic picture of a young Joe. Now, young Joe, looking great there, Joe. Probably a little bit bigger than you are now, um, but certainly um, as good looking. So well done, Joe. Thanks for sending this in. This is you in your heady days when you used to catch huge bags of silverfish on the pole apparently so well done to you and i'm glad that you're uh, listening to these pieces so i'm gonna catch you up this is a very interesting piece it's actually got quite um a twist in it because there's some squat fishing elements at the start and then commercial fishing in the second half and it's all about team fishing and what is really coming home to me looking back at these articles is my year was absolutely dominated by team fishing nearly all the time. It's actually quite crazy to look back at it and think how much we were actually doing. Um, certainly great times, no doubt. And it, it happens now, but in different ways, of course. And we'll probably reflect on that a little bit at the end. So um, I'm going to pick this up. There seems to be no let up after putting all our efforts into the Super League and Winter League final. And straight away, we're into the new Super League season. Now, this was when... Um, the Super League basically was regionalised, okay? So I think Paul Yates was running the Super League at this point. I might be wrong, but he, after a couple of national years, he changed to be this regionalised format. And now this was classed as the North, which mm, didn't really sit too well with us because I think our closest venue, or closest venue to me, was about 80 miles south. So, um, and you'll see now when we pick it up, it included venues in Nottingham, um, Leicester Way, and also on the drain. So more of a Midlands, I'd say, area. Now, due to the excessive travelling required, and we had some anglers away on international duty, we're going to need a massive effort to try and get this uh, um, qualified for the top two places because we really were short on the ground back then. This is in the days before we signed the likes of Matt Godfrey and Andy Geldart and James Den and um, Joe Joe Karras, you know, we just didn't have them at this point. And, um, you know, fantastic anglers they are, really, really fantastic anglers. And they would have been worthy additions back then. And, and sort of a couple of, in, a couple of the guys were losing interest as well. So it's a very interesting time, certainly for Barnsley Blacks, I know that much. Our first trip was up to the north level drain at Tig Goat in Lincolnshire. Now this is about 35 to 40 metres wide. Um, and it's a lot wider than the most of the drains usually know. It's relatively shallow, up to six feet. And practice matches were completely out of the question because it was 250 mile round trip from my house. But I had managed to get some info from super duper top Fenland drain angler Rob Lincoln, who doesn't go fishing anymore, plays golf, but still uh, a great mate. And he informed me that small fish were dominating the catches. And although there was an odd bream and skimmer coming out, it was still going to be small fish that dominated. And that was really the only information we could gauge. Now, as quite a good small fish team, we decided that small skimmers, roach and gudgeon on squats and pinkies were going to be the main attack. And then perch and bream were going to be a backup. My small fish um, approach had to be based on two lines, five and 10 meters, which incidentally, I don't really like to go any further than five to 10 meters out um, when I'm fishing with squats, because it's very difficult loose feeding past say 11 meters as it is. So 11 meters is about the limit really. I think loose feeding in such places is such a key part in squat fishing that you really have to remember that you can't be um, loose feeding past that sort of distance so you try to keep yourself a bit closer than that and that probably lends itself to the drains as well um i was part of hot rods for years and that gave me plenty of squat fishing experiences the likes of andy levers tim nash rob lincoln they all had different aspects and different abilities that i picked up on uh, and did we did really well and the final two years of my hot rods career i actually was the top point scorer in the winter league and super league campaigns for hot rods so I really felt confident with this style of fishing and I had a few secret weapons, as I called them. Um, they're not groundbreaking tactics, but a simple series of tricks that I always try to imply. First of all, I'd always base around loose feeding. 
keeping a constant stream of bait and keeping the fish in my peg meant I needed to take plenty of squats, but constantly introducing your bait. The key was judging the amount of bait. So you were looking for probably 10, 15 squats to start with, and then just looking to up the feed as you went on. How much could you up it before bites change? Then you have to bring it back and it was always trying to gauge it. I always sort of found 30 to 50 as an optimum really, especially where on venues where there's plenty of fish. You gotta remember sometimes tiny fish up in the water can eat squats because they sink so slowly. So very, very worthwhile remembering that you need to regulate your feed. And that was definitely one of the secret weapons. Um, I also would always set up four different styles of rig. The first one would be like a double bulk type rig or even like a, just a bulk down rig now probably, but this is a double bulk I'm referring to here. And then a bulk with three droppers. These would be like 11s or 12s, not big droppers like you'd use for bloodworm fishing. And then thirdly, and this was one of my secret weapons as well, to always have a rig that was like a bulk at half depth. So like here, it'd be a bulk three foot off bottom and then literally three number 13 spread out below. It's actually a rig I learned when I um, very first joined Hot Rods and it was a, a guy who'd also joined at the time, Dave Conte his name was, and he was next to me and uh, in a practice and he did unbelievably well on the 40 foot. And I went and looked at his rig and he had this like nice slow falling rig. It was really impressive. So worked well. Um, and then I'd always have like a really light strung out rig, but the problem was you couldn't always use the light strung out rig. So that bulk half depth was really important. The last three rigs always featured size 24 PR 31s and 06 hook lengths. I'm absolutely convinced of small, squats, uh, small hooks for squat fishing. Back then I was anyway, I'd probably go 22 now. Maybe I'm making a mistake there. Maybe I should be looking at 24s. Um, I remember once having 16 pound of rope all on a 24 with a single squat and never saw the need to increase um, the size because I would potentially miss out on valuable fish. But the best anglers always say the better presentation results in better fish and I think that's never truer than when you're squat fishing. Finally, finding the best area to catch in your peg is also crucial. Short, left, long, right, you can, it doesn't matter, but you don't always need to understand why, but often things happen under the water with different types of toe or the way fish move the bait around. And you can always drop in different areas of your peg and actually catch different fish. And that was a secret weapon with squat fishing as well, keeping those fish coming. Um, finally, also don't forget, uh, you can catch often really far downstream. So not just a little bit left and right, like two or three meters downstream. Uh, it is strange, but like I say, you don't always need to know why you do things. These squat lessons took me a long time to learn, but they can be applied to all sorts of different types of fishing. Back to the match itself, and on the whistle in went half a pot of hemp, three balls of super match and super lake. I'd probably be using river and lake, uh, Sony river and lake now combined as a backup. Then I began emptying six big feeder fulls of worms and casters across. I was on my third cast when either side of me were playing a good skimmer, that's not ideal. So all my plans potentially gone out of the window, but Bearing in mind what happened in the last article and sticking to what I was uh, doing and trying to make the best of it, I had five minutes on the feeder and then went squat fishing. Um, no bites on the feeder, so started catching gudgeon and tiny skimmers, but because it was really windy, I couldn't loose feed squats long. I remember this now. I couldn't loose feed them long. I had to loose feed hemp long and then squat short, and I, and I managed to rotate these two rigs until eventually the wind dropped and I could loose feed some squats longer and I was picking up small roach along with the odd better fish up to six ounces. By the end all my old tricks are coming to play and despite anglers in my section all catching those early skimmers I was still delighted to win the section with seven pound eight ounces. Job done. Simon Field on the bridge peg had also won his section and as expected with a mega ten pound it also framed in the match but the bad news started to filter back. Skimmers had fed early throughout on the feeder and our small fish plan had actually let us down. We ended up six points behind the leaders on the day, Dyra Trentman. The following Sunday was another long journey, certainly was, down to Lakeview Fishery at Melton Mowbray. Beautiful place. I'm not always convinced it's absolutely solid with fish, but it's a beautiful place, uh, uh, Lakeview. And it was a Super League uh, fixture again, but it was a practice match, a chance to practice. I drew peg seven on Oasis which is a reasonable area apparently and there was plenty of tall trees and shelter i actually remember there was no ripple elsewhere on the lake apart from down at the bottom end 
So all our area was flat, but it was really windy and there was a big swell on. I was next to MIDI star Rob Wooten. I know him now. He's, uh, he's all right, he is. And he came second in the previous Open. Well done, Rob. Great performance. And he was on the end peg. Oh, odds are against me. Odds are against me here. So although the wind was blowing the other end of the section, we both, both felt we were going to be the wrong end. But obviously Rob's end peg, so, you know. Uh, my attack focused around three swims across of 18 inches of water down the track and down the margins. Now, I was really into maggot fishing back then, so I brought with me a load of maggots to keep the fish occupied, whereas it looked to me like Rob was going to be starting on pellets. I went straight across and didn't have any bites whatsoever on maggots, and Rob got off to a really good start, catching around 10 fish, and he was probably winning the lake. So I was starting to think up some good excuses. I had been feeding down the track, though, and gave... Um, before I found the nearest tree to swing from, it says here, a run of skimmers were encouraging and a two pound carp. I was feeding very heavily with maggots every drop in and the peg was fizzing like crazy. Tried cutting it back, that worked for a while, but then the fish disappeared. But Rob had also completely slowed up here. Now in reality, that's because the wind was pushing the other way and it was flat and he caught the fish that he'd caught across probably. Um, and I began experimenting with a big pot of maggots after every carp. Again, this worked for a while, and then it fizzed and I couldn't catch. And it led me to think that maybe it was skimmers fizzing as well. Um, and I'd catch an odd one of these a pound a piece, but I couldn't figure out how to catch regularly. I think the reason I didn't catch a cross was due to the lack of ripple and the water was quite clear. And of course, Rob now wasn't catching anything at all across. So um, by changing the feeding, I actually managed to keep odd fish coming. So I'd just change it. I'd like feed half a pot, uh, loose feed for a bit and just mix it up. It was almost like the fish would get confused for a bit and you'd catch a couple more. Caught steadily for the last half of the match and put £40 on the scales, which was actually third on the lake beaten by the two end pegs that the wind would end. Um, the fish had totally left Rob and he ended up with £20. And, uh, you know, he commented that his pellet tactics left him pretty limited once the fish had left him behind. But as you can imagine, um, I can imagine back then, obviously I was practicing for a team match. Rob was probably fishing there as an open, so it's a totally different approach to be fair. But this gave me a really good idea that maggot would be a very good approach for the following week. And it was actually used the same tactics to put 58 pound 10 ounces in the net for second in the section. However, the team struggled again and it meant we needed a lot of work for the final two rounds if we were going to qualify. And I can't remember whether we did or not, but I'm sure we'll find out at a later date. And they've got two nice little columns here as well, which are um, firstly on the Super League. It's uh, along with many other people, we seem to be of the opinion that the Super League competition needs to shake up to maintain its high profile. I do believe it went on for one more season after this with the same profile and then finished. Um, our own league is classed as Northern, but we had loads of big journeys. Uh, I've put here that I personally think a National League is still a good uh, way to go rather than regional, uh, but with bigger incentives and different things. Smaller team sizes, <laughs> top six qualifying for the final, um, relegation and promotion systems from uh, uh, two divisions. Maybe the winners of the second division also get a place in the final, I've put here. Um, and, you know, obviously in the summer, if we were talking 13, 14 smaller teams, we'd have good big matches that would run well. Now, that isn't exactly what happened, but does that sound familiar to the Super League that we're now running? Feeder Masters, Sony Bait Super League, runs with 15 teams, four-man teams. That's even smaller than we could have imagined back then. What a success that is. 70-plus teams applied to get in that this year, and that is a national league. I actually think there still would be a place for something like this for certain people, um, but it would have to be done right. So very interesting to read those comments. I've also spoke here about the UK champs. So if you tuned in yesterday, um, I did say that I bombed out at Lindome and I wasn't hiding. I've written it here, bombed out at Lindome, caught nothing. So the title was got out. I actually finished last but one. I did myself an injustice yesterday. And then in round three was at Willinghurst and I was on peg two on a new lake. Some really great anglers. I remember this uh, actually. I fished paste and I caught some big fish, about 10 really big fish early doors. Finished with 12 for £92.10 ounces and John Arthur's 12 carp catch, which was the same as mine. So I had 12, he had 12 and I thought he was going to do me and he was on his way. I think he'd been UK champion two years running at that point. Well done, John. 
Uh, he actually had £80, but Andy Finley picked me for the section with 105 I was second on the lake and actually fifth in the match. So they had two brilliant rounds of the UK champ, just that one Lindome round that should have been a banker letting me down. But again, I, I didn't fish a good match at Lindome. Conditions beat me that day, I seem to recall. Windy and it was a bit nasty. Any, anybody's guess who's going to win at this point? I've put here, Kieran Rich was doing really well. John Arthur was only two points behind. Um... And John, I apologise if you did win this for a third time. I can't remember if this was the time you did. Either way, I think you're brilliant. So um, even uh, if you did go on to win it, well done. Maybe we'll cover that next month. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's little episode. Um, we'll be back tomorrow. Why not? There isn't much else to do. Well, we'll catch up on the next month's uh, exploits um, from back in 2008. See you later.